Welcome to Console Room's panel called Prop Shop. We are today going to talk about how many cosplays, costumes require props in order to, you know, complete the costume and, and know what you are. We're going to discuss materials today and techniques on various ways you can create your props. So I'm Natasha Krentz. I'll be your moderator for today, but I do also have some prop making experience. Uh, Taylor, tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Taylor Jusco. I write a lot of spec fake and sci-fi, but I love going to cons and cosplaying and all that kind of stuff. Been doing it for a really long time. Uh, not really an expert, all self-taught. Still think sewing is alchemy because I don't understand how you can take a flat sheet of fabric and needle thread and then make stuff that's like wearable because that's just whew, it's voodoo. It's incredible. Um, but yeah, I, I focus a lot on cost play, C-O-S-T play which is like using cheaper stuff and found stuff and changing things that already exist but have definitely dabbled with uh, more elaborate construction techniques including commissioning pieces by people who actually know what they're doing all right thank you cynthia hi i'm cynthia porter i run emerald raven creations which is a little mostly jewelry and accessory shop but i also like to cosplay and dress up in my free time um, I focus a lot on steampunk, um, which is a lot of recycled materials and doing it in your own way. Um, and I will occasionally make things that are from other people's imaginations as well. Um, and I sometimes get commissions to do that. I'm, I'm definitely more self-taught, but I also did go to Hamlin University and I have a bachelor's in sociology and um, also minored in studio arts. So I have some classical training as well. Very good. And I would say my specialty is the fabric part, <laughs> the actual sewing of the costumes. And in most of my props, it there there is some sort of fabric involved usually. So I usually rely heavily on other people's skills for how do I how do I do this thing. So let's talk about how do I do those things. First of all, I do want to preface that I strongly believe there's no wrong way to do props. Um, just like there's no wrong way to do costumes. It's your costume. It's your creation. It's your imagination. It gets to be what you want it to be. But how do we how do we get there? Um, what what goes into making that prop? Uh, Cynthia, you were talking uh, earlier about the three things that go into prop making. Yes, you've got um, skill level. Um, if you've got enough skill level, you can take anything and make it look good. Um, but if you don't have a skill level, um, you can take your money and make somebody else make it look good for you. And if you don't have money or skill, then if you take enough time, you can still make something that looks good, um, regardless of those two things. But, you know, one of them will bypass the other. Like, it's the whole, you can get something cheap and good, but it won't be fast. Or you can, like, those three things, basically the same thing. Cool. Taylor, you have any comments along these lines? Um, I agree wholeheartedly. I think that, and there's a lot of interconnectedness between those three points. Like the more uh, good, that's not a word, or that's in proper grammar, the better or more elaborate the prop is going to be, then that would definitely kind of raise the stakes for all three categories. And if you lower any one of those, it's almost like your attributes on like a created character. It's like, well, if you don't have a lot of skill, but you really want something that's going to take a ton of, you know, uh, 
a finished product that's going to be really, really, really groovy, then you've got to like substantially overcompensate by raising how much time it's going to take or how much money you need to sink into it. And vice versa, if you don't have a ton of money and you only have a few items, then you really need to make sure that either you or the person you work with has a ton of skill or a lot of time to kind of take your lower cost or cheaper materials to make them into what you're looking for. So they're all kind of kind of wibbly wobbly in that way. It's less of a straight progression between idea and execution, and more of a big ball of timey wimey prop stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of progression, um, these three factors play a big role, but so does planning. Let's talk a little bit about planning. Because I know that in some cases, you can literally just walk into a store and go, hey, look, there's that prop I've been looking for. <laughs> but oftentimes that's not the case. So how do we, how do we plan? Taylor? Uh, I think for what works for me, and the, like you said earlier, there's no right or wrong way, or there's no wrong way to do it. Uh, the right way is however you end up doing it, is kind of thinking about the end product, which in some cases might be getting ahead of the whole idea of planning, but really focusing on, okay, for, for this prop, what role do I want it to play in the cost? Is this going to be the centerpiece or is this literally just something actually like a little detail that will be noticed to kind of add to an already groovy costume or something like that? Uh, and then once I have that figured out, like if it's going to be the centerpiece, like, all right, the cost is very basic. It's just like a t-shirt and some slacks with maybe like a funky hat. And it's really going to be based on this prop. Well, then that's when the planning comes in, especially with the character of like, okay, is it something that's seen all the time? Is it something that's notable? Or is it going to be something that's more like a deep cut where like only like the really, really hardcore extreme fans would like pick up like, oh, that's such and such from that character. Or is it going to be something a little bit broader where it's like, oh, you're going to be Cyclops from X-Men. You've got a visor that's kind of expected. So it's really that sort of balance. Like once I like I figure out what the prop is going to, what role the prop will play in the overall costume, uh, then deciding, do I want that prop to be the focus or a detail? And then lastly, like going back to those three points. All right, now I've got this idea. How are we going to make this thing real? Yeah, the only planning that's bad is no planning. <laughs> like, I just magically think that this is going to work out. Like, I, I believe that I'm going to go forth into the universe and it's going to happen. No. <laughs> Very nice you think that way. <laughs> um, but yeah, like Taylor said, you want to make sure that your props match your costume or and figure out where your skills lie, going back to the skill, time, money thing. Um, and decide where you're going from that. Like, if you can't sew, then you're definitely gonna have to know that you can find the pieces or pay somebody else to do it. Um, and you have to kind of plan out like your budget based around that then. And if you don't have a budget, you're going to be very sad every once in a while. <laughs> and if you don't plan, it makes it a lot harder to stay within your budget because you can't use that cool coupon for whatever object, um, like that's very important as far as for me, like planning ahead, being able to use those time, those money saving things is really important to me when I'm doing this because like I work as part-time as a florist, it's not great pay. I know uh, in some of the cosplay groups that I have, been part of we made a hard rule that there's no sewing in the hotel room and so that helped force people to uh, work on the planning aspect like okay we're halfway to the con you're not halfway done with your project how are we how are you going to accomplish this so that you don't have to waste fun con time sitting in your hotel room working on your cosplay um and most of the people really found that helpful and uh, appreciated the push to say like no we're not we're not working on things in the hotel room because once you're at con you're supposed to be enjoying con <laughs> um so yeah you will have to other 
Go ahead. And I was going to say any other points on planning? <laughs> Occasionally, you have to check in and see that your original plan has stayed and it's been realistic. You will have things that throw it off. Like, I can always go to this one place and get this one kind of glue that I need and then they're out and you don't have anywhere else you can go. Um, if you're in a smaller area, like that can definitely throw things off. You have to order it on the internet now and it takes a couple of days to ship or longer than that currently. And what do you do then? Like, is there something you can substitute or do you just have to wait the time out? Is there things you can do in the meantime when you're waiting? Like constantly check in on your progress if you're doing a larger project. If you're just grabbing something out of the closet and putting it together, cool. Yeah. Oh. Actually, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going <laughs> to say um, some of the, the, there's no wrong way to do things. So my way of, of processing projects is I will have the idea in my head and I will think and think and think and think, okay, how am I gonna put this together? How am I gonna put this together? Do a bunch of measurements, do a lot of drafting, usually in my head. Um, eventually I will go get the fabric that I need. And then the fabric will sit there on my sewing table looking at me while I continue to think through how am I gonna put this together? What, what step comes first? How, how do I do this? And while I'm doing that, I'm also thinking about like what props, what accessories, do I need a necklace? Do I need a key? And then like slowly gather all the materials. And then once I feel like, okay, I think I've, I think I've got this all worked out, then I will start actually working on it. But even then I'll get to a point where I'll go, oh, that didn't quite work. Let's try this instead. I have, people in my cosplay groups that find my way of doing that very frustrating <laughs> because the way they do it is they say, okay, I have this idea. I have this pattern to get the fabric, start sewing, and then think of the next step and then work on the next step and then think of the next step and work on the next step. And for me, I find that frustrating. But like I said, this is what works best for you. How how do you do it? There's no wrong way. It's the right way for you. Taylor. I was just going to throw in another point of consideration is like some of the less sexy, like the practical aspects of uh, the prop or the accessory, uh, especially if you are planning it for a con, whether it's a, a multi-day con where you'll, it'll just be one in a series of costumes that you'll be using the prop, or if it's like even just a one-off where you're like, okay, I'm going to like this one day event or I only want to wear it for like the masquerade portion. There's like the kind of the practical consideration. So things like, is this comfortable? If I have to carry it, um, is it something that I'm going to be worried about? Going back to those three points, if it is something that I've invested a ton of money or a ton of time or took time to learn the skills to really build this thing and something, a creation that I care about or is valuable to me, whether that's financial value or even just kind of like the pride of having made something, is it something I trust in a convention environment where it's like there might be lots of people around uh, or at least there used to be back before the world closed or uh, something I can set down? Can I sit comfortably? And it's something I'm going to be worried about in the back of my mind, like, OK, I don't want to break this. I don't want to break this where it's going to take away from that enjoyment of the con, as you mentioned, uh, especially for wearables like handhelds. I think it's more about losing and like the kind of the burden of having to keep track of it with wearables. Uh, with things like mask, headpieces, any kind of accessory or appliances, it's like, all right, I can wear this for 10 minutes at home, checking it out, looks great. Now I have to multiply that 10 minutes times. All right, if I wanna wear this for two hours, six hours, eight hours, is it still gonna be just as cool and comfortable? Or is it the kind of thing where I'll find myself running back to the hotel room or running back to my car to get rid of, which might take away from the costs or kind of undermine all the time and energy and financial investment that was put into in the first place. Um, definitely have some examples, but I'm gonna hold off on that because I don't wanna dominate the conversation. But I think those practical considerations, and even little things like the weight of the material. Um, my first costume ever, I found out the hard way that there's the reason why people don't wear a lot of heavy leather suede and non breathable materials in the middle of summer. Uh, lost a ton of weight that day, wasn't my intention. Uh, 
<laughs> also find out what heat stroke feels like. But like little things like that, those kind of considerations of like, all right, it's August. I'm at a convention. There's lots of people. Do I want to add an additional like 25 pounds slash, you know, 50, 60 degrees to my body weight and temperature? Probably not. So maybe think of a way to like, how do I balance that out? It's like, oh, this is lightweight. I can wear it. Or I'm not going to be worried about it if I sit down and have a drink at like one of the party rooms and my worry is going to disappear or break or something like that. So those practical considerations definitely weigh heavily. Usually after the fact, uh, to be honest, in my experience, I'm like, oh, this was a terrible idea. I shouldn't have done this. But then it's just kind of like, then for the next time, I'm like, all right, and now I know maybe full length leather jacket, not a great idea in the middle of summer. Big props is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The first con I went to, I went with somebody who was doing Wolfwood, the, you know, giant six foot cross. And I kept getting smacked in the face with it every time somebody would stop him for a picture and he'd take it off his shoulder. And yeah, don't do that to other people around <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up the uh, practicality. Are you doing this to wear all day? Or are you doing it just for masquerade? I know in the, the, the outfit aspect, that's something that we talk about a lot in the cosplay panels is part of your planning is exactly that. How are you going to be using this? Um, because if you're going to be wearing it all day as a casual cosplay versus for masquerade and you need it to do exactly this thing during the masquerade, that's going to affect your choices for how you build it. If you need it to do something special versus you just need it to look a certain way, that that changes your choices for how you put it together. So um, I know that as we get into talking about materials and how to actually build things, more of the planning that goes into each of those things is going to is going to come through. So let's talk about materials. Let's say we're going to make things ourselves or maybe get some friends to help us to um, what are material choices that we want to use, don't want to use examples of pros and cons and lessons learned through, through all the things. <laughs> Who wants to start? Uh, <laughs> Cynthia's got it. There's so much there um, because like Taylor was talking about it could get lost or can walk away. Um, like, so you don't want to necessarily always use the most expensive material you possibly can, but like it'll break or whatever else. So you don't want to use the cheapest thing either necessarily sometimes like amazing things can be made out of cardboard like so awesome, but it'll get really, really heavy um, pretty quickly, which is like, do you wanna carry it around with you? Um, so like insulation board is great and a lot of people don't always think about it. Um, it's super lightweight and it kind of goes that line between expensive and like not too terrible to work with. Um, so it can be really useful to know about and not everybody knows about it. Um, although getting it home sometimes can be fun because it comes in like 10 foot by eight foot sheets that you buy at the hardware store. Um, and it, it can dent really easily. So like, it's not always like, I could put my fingernail through this if I wanted to, but, um, you usually coat it in something else. Um, so like, yeah, there's there's found materials, there's ex there's warbla, warbla is lots of fun. Um, there's three, a whole lot about, um, what would you say about materials, Taylor? Um, yeah, I think you, you kind of hit the head there with like the durability and then the weight and the cost coming into play. One of the things I like to think about too is about the repairs, uh, the inevitability. So with materials that are a little bit on the cheaper, lighter weight side, so things like cardboard, even uh, I know Pepakura, which is kind of like elaborate paper designs that are folded and glued, um, very cheap, 
very comparatively or can be very easy as far as like the learning curve to get into, then it's a matter of just sort of treating it or at least the two prong approach again no wrong way. Uh, but the way as the two prong there's either make it cheap make it quick because you know if something happens to it one you won't really care too much and two, if you have to do an on site repair, it can kind of be done decently ish uh, I know with a lot of the cardboard props that I've used. Uh, duct tape from like the hotel front desk has been a lifesaver because like oh shit I didn't oops I didn't mean to break this but I can run quickly duct tape the inside and kind of hide it um, and that that's fine uh, same thing with like crazy glue on some 3D printed materials but then with Peppacura uh, with some of the paper folding or even incorporating mixed media things where you have like an EVA foam with cardboard and paper uh, treating it certain ways so I do sort of a uh, or not just, I didn't make this up, but what I read about, and it works for me, is the like, you know, three parts water, two parts Elmer's glue to kind of make a cheap Mod Podge that kind of strengthens it, but it adds lightweight, uh, or it's a lightweight way to strengthen some flimsier materials. Um, I also like to use a lot of the cheaper plastics in some of my props, uh, because I do have like a heat gun and soldering iron. And in those instances, uh, sometimes simply just melting uh, tear or break kind of helps with those last minute fixes. But really it's about what's most comfortable. I, I think with the, the one drawback to using a lot of found objects, which is something that I do a ton, like I'd say the bulk of my prop making is starts with something found and I just kind of embellish on that base is working with this variety of materials and then trying to figure out how is this going to be salvageable if the worst were to happen. Um, yeah, like, uh, oh yeah, we did, you showed your awesome, awesome. Cynthia's amazing, right? Right, Cynthia's so great. I love Cynthia, Cynthia's incredible. I'm your biggest fan right now. Um, but I did a clockwork droid. This was just a wall decoration. It was a Venetian gesture mask. So it had like a huge hat, bells and whistles, cut all that stuff off on the inside. But then I found out the hard way, uh, I think you can kind of see that, that it's this weird sort of like very tough plastic so it's meant to mimic, I mean, it was, again, it was a wall decoration, so it was meant to mimic a porcelain. So very hard, couldn't melt it, uh, couldn't even sand it down. I had to use a rotary sander to get the edges so I wouldn't stab myself in the face. But <laughs> the nice thing is that it is extremely durable. Uh, when I affixed the paintball strap mask to keep it on my face and everything like that, this was, I felt like I could have actually like went out and played hockey or something because it's extremely tough. And I mean, you could probably use it to stop your car from rolling down a hill or something like that. But had I tried to make this myself with like cardboard and things like that, I definitely would not have been going for that particular level of durability. Uh, but the sacrifice in that case then is that doing alterations to it to make it into the mask took a lot more. Again, it, I needed to use a rotary sander or a power sander rather to get the edges down. It was a huge undertaking to get it just so it wouldn't, you know, scar up my, I mean, my face isn't that great to begin with, but I don't want to cover it in like deep gashes and bleeding at a con is usually not a good idea, or at least not from the face. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that took a like dark that, turn. <laughs> masks like that can be easily made out of leather if you know what you're doing, but um, that's a whole different skill set and cost, And but it's a lot easier to get exactly what you want from it. Um, so yeah, there's that skill versus skill cost and, you know, our trifecta again. Um, so yeah, leather is a material that I love working with. And I know there are some people who are skittish about it due to like vegan concerns. And I understand that too. Um, so I'm not gonna talk too much about leather, um, but nature's plastic, it's amazing. Uh, it works almost like warbler, except, you know, it's compostable later um oh god i'm sorry got distracted <laughs> tiny things um where where are we supposed to be going next well we're we're still talking about materials and this is there there's so many materials like you said uh so maybe why don't we go with uh talking about like specific props that you made and therefore the materials that went into them and maybe what you could have done instead at, as you learned. Okay. And we can go back and forth and do a whole bunch of different examples, so. 
Well, going back to this and the whole, you don't have the right glue. You can see there's a spot over here because I tried to repair it with a type of glue that actually melted the foam. So yeah, sometimes you have to test your materials to make sure they actually are compatible. And um, I, I only use hot glue on this from now on. Um, it's also got some um, craft foam here. And again, that, that whole phone, found object thing, th these are paint caps. Um, Taylor's turn. <laughs> awesome. um, yeah, so I got, uh, so a good example of like the cheap and easy quick time. This was a Destro. It was a character from, oh, he's like already flaking, which is kind of to the point. A Destro mask from G.I. Joe. Destro is the character who has like the silver head that he's locked into, kind of like a very smooth Cyberman. Uh, so this was basically just an EVA foam face. And you can actually kind of see where the paint was coming off. So you can see the orange foam underneath it. Uh, and then the base or the majority of the actual helmet was cardboard, which I then covered in what I thought was a great hack, covered in masking tape, and then a layer of duct tape for strength stability and flexibility. Uh, you can kind of see the inside is really just a mess of cardboard and duct tape down in there. Uh, so this mask was not very breathable because it was just encasing your head in foam, cardboard, and tape, not to mention the amount of spray paint and color that was used. There are different types of paint. And I think to uh, Cynthia's point uh, with the glue, finding the right materials to work with is just as important as the skill, time, and money. Uh, so yeah, the same spray paints that you'd use to paint, I don't know, your house or furniture, usually not the best thing to keep, you know, centimeters away from your face for extended periods of time uh, because of fumes, those little warnings about make sure there's ventilation. Those are for real. You should definitely do it. I mean, I'm not going to say it wasn't fun to be high, but um, usually if you're into that kind of entertainment, it's because you want to do it on purpose, uh, which is definitely not the case in voluntary high. And so I took the lessons learned from this very interesting Destro mask and then moved on to the found objects. Uh, in addition to that mask being really uncomfortable because it was mostly cardboard and things like that. Uh, it was also very unwieldy because uh, I couldn't really turn my head much because the way that I measured it was just to go from the neck down. So I found, again, going to the found objects and then building from there, this was an Iron Man mask, which I think you can still kind of see some of the details of where the Mark III armor was. Uh, and then using modeling clay, which is a little bit lighter, but not as heavy as potter's clay to do the accents on the face and then using a rubbing paint. And on the inside, just adding some pieces of foam so that way the plastic wouldn't be so heavy. So it was much lighter. Uh, I didn't lose consciousness or my train of thought. Uh, looked a lot better, I think. Could wear it more often, slightly more durable. As you can see, it still actually looks like a head as opposed to that sort of sad, pierogi that I just held up previously. Pierogies are delicious, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but again, that was sort of the trial and error. And then again, those considerations of like, okay, I know I'm gonna be wearing this for an extended period of time. So I don't wanna be poisoning myself with noxious fumes. I also wanna be able to turn my head and walk around and do things that people who have heads usually do, like see and breathe and things of that nature. Uh, and also it's because it was just like a cheap children's toy, uh, you can kind of see how thin it is and very lightweight plastic. Uh, not super durable, but not really concerned about it because it was so cheap. This is really more of an aesthetic piece, but it was very lightweight. Uh, and so lesson, lesson definitely learned about mixed media and then kind of like those environmental and practicality considerations coming into play. Plus it's kind of fun because I can just kind of stroke them, do sort of a weird like Blofeld, like no, Mr. Stark. Yeah, anyway, that's a little bit of a tangent. <laughs> So one, one of the, oh. uh, one of the you, you. cosplays that I made was a Grecian, a Grecian outfit. And without the props, it's just a Grecian outfit. My friends and I, we did, we wanted to be the fates. So what props do you need as the fates? We decided to come up with a spindle because one of them weaves the thread of life and 
and then a rope because the other one takes the thread and then creates the rope. And then the third fate uh, determines how long your life thread gets to be. And so for, for that prop, we chose to make scissors. Uh, but as you all know, going to conventions, there's usually um, policies around props and safety and what you can and can't carry around without having it safety checked. So we didn't really want to carry around real scissors. Also, they're small and harder to see. So I chose to make scissors out of that foam board that you can also use to like create displays on for you know like science fair projects and stuff and it worked great from the aspect that it was super light and i could make it big enough that people could see it from really far away but uh after wearing it all day for one day and then trying to pack it again the next time i brought it out the poor scissors were folded in half <laughs> whoops so, and I, I literally just, you know, two pieces of crap foam cut the same and then find a little screw and nut to put a hole in the middle to attach them to, kind of like real scissors. And that worked really great. And it was really simple and really cheap, but, and then it broke. Uh, so if I were to make it again, I'm not sure what material I would use to keep it big, keep it light, but also make it stronger than it was the first time. So that's one of the props that I, I'm thinking about. How can I make this better? And I haven't found the answer yet. But. Warbler. The answer is warbler. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that may, that's something that should have went back like in planning you just mentioned. Like some, some of the conventions that I've been to have like six page rules about your props like what you can and can't do. Like Anime Central, lots and lots of rules about what the prop can and cannot be. And um, I will, I when I did panels there about props, I would always mention like, look at the prop policy before you decide what you're gonna do because it can't have any metal in it at all, not even like through the center if it's covered in foam. And it can't be like, any larger than you are. So if you want to be Wolfwood and you want to carry around the six foot cross, you've got to be six foot yourself. Um, so like, sorry, tangent from materials, but yeah, in your planning, make sure which cons you're going to bring this to, you're actually allowed to bring it to. Because I've actually seen like cons where you're allowed to carry a lot around like real weapons as long as you get them peace bound and that would be not acceptable at others. Um, but I was going to talk about um, kind of an accessory prop that I made for one of my first steampunk costumes. Um, I wanted to make like a really big choker. And Taylor was talking about being able to move your head. Yeah, I, I was stuck. Like I could not move my head the usual directions. And I learned in the future to make that a little bit more narrow um, or a different material I could have done in the future because um, yeah, Warbla can be used for a lot of different things, but I would not suggest it for net neckwear. Well, Cynthia brings up an excellent point too about abiding by the guidelines, because that's, I guess, that definitely falls into like, the practicality, because, yeah, actually hanging on my wall, you can kind of, that black behind the wig, can I get my finger there? There we go. That is a full length sword, uh, a replica of uh, what Snake Eyes carries, big G.I. Joe fan. Uh, and it's great. It looks really cool because it's an officially licensed replica and all that stuff. But uh, it had to get peace bonded. And then even after that's fine for walking around, when you're carrying around a real sword, which those do tend to get heavy, but then also being mindful of now your body space is no longer from like elbow to elbow or shoulder to shoulder. You also have this weird, well, you have a sword sticking out a couple inches on each side so you can't turn you can't sit you can't bend without maybe bumping people or at least when you do turn and bend and sit you have to be very mindful of the fact that you have a sharp piece of metal hanging off of your back uh, and then other cons even if though that cost i thought was pretty groovy uh there are definitely cons where like no no weapons of any sort that aren't clearly not weapons so unless it's made of foam or obviously like a future ray gun not to be mistaken for something not that something could be mistaken for a real gun uh, so that has to sit at home. 
uh, which again, as a fan, love having it. But the fact that I've only been able to use it like for a few times uh, over the past like 10 years, that kind of, again, that value system. So there's sort of that value going into the creation of a prop, whether you're gonna buy it, find it, et cetera. There's also, at least for me, again, no wrong way to do it. That sort of longevity aspect to it. Like, can this prop be, the prop that you repurpose, can that be further repurposed? Can you build off of that? Or is it something that you'll have to replace later on? Uh, example of that, I, so I'm an older, older fella. I grew up in the 80s. So G.I. Joe, all that stuff, but also like Skeletor. And Skeletor, excuse <laughs> me, one of his most distinctive props is his staff. Uh, and so this is probably a great example of all the different uh, techniques we talked about. So the skull was from a, uh, one of those like Spirit Halloweens because November 1st is a great day to visit Spirit Halloween because everything's like 50 to 80% off. Uh, and even though this skull is probably not anatomically correct, it's just a matter of a little bit of paint to get the horns golden. Uh, <laughs> then it's just a little EVA foam for the weird decoration that Skeletor has on it and uh, the stopper to make it into a walking stick. I don't know if you can really see that. Yeah. It's just a piece of, uh, again, EVA foam, which really was just an old yoga mat that I folded, shoved in the bottom of this like really cheap, bendy, very lightweight piece of plastic. Uh, it looks kind of sad now. Wrapped the base in duct tape for a little extra durability with some scraping on the floor. It's really, really cool. Uh, and the head itself is literally just secured. I was a Boy Scout back in the day. So it's just an old ship knot. That, that's all that's keeping it in place uh, to the staff. But again, very durable. Could do all the silly like ack, 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 Skeletor stuff. Uh, the entire thing came out to a final cost of I think about $6 total. Uh, the majority of that, which was spent on the cheap plastic skull decoration from Spirit Halloween clearance sale. Everything else just yoga mats that were painted, painted random piece of crappy plastic, which I think went to like a child's tent. One of those little pop-ups that you put over a kid's bed. Uh, and then again, more yoga mat for the stopper. That way I could, you know, bang it against the ground without worrying too much about shattering the silly plastic, things like that. Uh, yeah. This was, this was a fun one, I like this one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can say I will never make wings. <laughs> I will never ever make and wear wings that are like any more past my shoulders than this in the future after the one time of doing it. Never again. Yeah. I think, um, so I'm in my workshop, so I got some stuff to share, but uh, one of the things I, and I kind of mentioned we were talking a little bit before the panel was like really, really simple elements that can really enhance the cost. So the pirate fellow behind me, he's wearing a double breasted waist, which was actually originally part of a different cost that I was doing as the time traveler from H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. But walking around in Victorian era garb just looked like some dude walking around in Victoria era garb. There's nothing really to tie me to the time machine fandom. Uh, and so I literally just ran down to the hotel business center and printed off a copy of the schematic with a little bit of cheap Photoshop. Yay. And so this prop cost 25 cents and it was just printing it, but it made a huge difference because the first three hours at the con is like, oh, steampunk guy, or like, oh, that guy's just dressed like somebody from the 19th century. Uh, as soon as you have a schematic of the time machine, the distinctive one from the old George Powell movie, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's awesome. It's the time machine guy. It's the time machine guy. Uh, and for me, for that cost, that's really what I was going for was getting that sort of like, oh, time machine. That's awesome. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think going back to that point too about what part you want the, co the prop to play in the cost. I think another thing too with prop considerations is that a lot of the store-bought stuff, you're kind of tied to whatever the marketing department or licensing department decided was going to be that prop, like huge Hoovian. Uh, but a lot of the sonic screwdrivers, they are okay, but they look like toys. Um, even the 13th Doctor, who is my second favorite Doctor after seven, actually they're tied for first because Jody is amazing. <sighs> Jody, like her Sonic is great, but it looks very dinky. It's very really teeny tiny. This is the store bought officially licensed BBC, like Jody screwdriver that lights up and makes sounds and all that. But it's it's so. Um, 
like it's not a bad prop to have as a fan, but really it's just sort of there. It's like great, spent twelve bucks, and now I have this cute piece of plastic that lights up, but doesn't add anything to the character. It's not as much much fun <laughs> as roaming around uh, as Clockwork George or something like that. But then every so often they'll do stuff like they have like the make your own screwdriver so that you can kind of embellish and add to it. And so you can combine like the fifth and sixth doctor screwdriver with the 11th doctor screwdriver. And so there's all those customization elements, which kind of goes to that whole idea of like, all right, so got this one piece. How can I extend it to other pieces? And then that way too, because the 11th doctor, yeah, Matt Smith, he's a cutie. He's adorable, but he's like this big. He's so teeny tiny. And me, I'm like, there's so much me, way too much dude in this t-shirt. Um, so to get a more- I think there's a, enough dude in t-shirt. Aw, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that's what most people say, like, oh, that's enough dude. That's definitely enough dude. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but by making it, giving it the meteor base of like the fifth and sixth doctor screwdriver, that way it doesn't look like I'm holding a toy. Cause like my hands around the 13th screwdriver, it's it's sort of, this is too, this is a lot. But now it's sort of like, yeah, oh, like now it looks like a screwdriver, even though it's not, you know, Canon or whatever. Uh, so again, that's kind of upcycle, continuing and going, lots of considerations. And there's also whether you want to be doing a character that, <clears throat> like you said, now I'm immediately recognizable as this character versus do you want to do your own character and then have people go, are you this thing or not? Or like the one time I did, uh, I did like a side character where I wasn't recognizable as a character without the person I was with. And then I just had a whole bunch of people looking at me like, why is she wandering around in a prom dress? Like, and that was very frustrating to me to not actually get recognized as the character unless, so yeah. Cause I put the effort into the outfit and then nobody knew who I was unless I was with the person I was with. Absolutely. I think too, cleverness goes a long way. Uh, so even if you're watching something, which as junky as my workshop is, the one thing I don't still have is one of my favorite props, which is really ridiculous, which is a piece of foam board into a shape of a word bubble. Uh, so there's a character called Captain Hiller from the Independence Day movies. He was played by Will Smith. Uh, from ID4. And I made a speech bubble that just said, welcome to Earth with an F and carried that around. Now that's obviously not in the movie, uh, but when you're dressed in like army fatigues, just a black tank top and camel pants and you hold up a little sign that says, welcome to Earth. Like that immediately, I think I got more positive reactions from that walking around than some of my more elaborate, more like canonical, like screen accurate cosplay. So like that cleverness aspect or like even being witty, especially because uh, and maybe it's just me, but I like to have fun at cons. And so it, it's less about like, oh, like you're not wearing, that's not exact, the exact buttons that such and such character had, or it's like actually, like, you know, the well actually crowd, those aren't my people. I'm more about the, <laughs> the fun people. And one of the fun aspects can be cool things like those sort of witticisms uh, and things like that, where it's sort of like, all right, this isn't maybe what you'd see of that character or what you read that character doing in the graphic novel, but it's in the spirit of the character. Um, but yeah, I'm very sad I don't have that speech bubble anymore. Uh, anyway, sorry. But you could probably <laughs> easily make it again. Yes, absolutely. So uh, we've talked a lot about different ways we can make things and materials to get out of them to make things yourself. Let's, what about like you have this idea, but you aren't really sure how to do it how can people get help? Like, um, I know I, I use my friends as a resource um, and we talk about different ideas back and forth to figure out, um, oh yeah, I use this type of glue with this and it doesn't work and therefore uh, I learned that you need to use this. Are there ways you can find that information yourself? Uh, what, what's your experience with that? Google is my friend because I, I have the Google flu. I can find anything on the internet, except the one thing that I needed like 12 years ago, but that was before there was so much internet. Um, YouTube has amazing tutorials. Um, you could like 
for making Marceline's guitar here, I actually went on the internet and somebody already had the pattern all figured out. I could print it if I wanted to. Like you can literally find how to do various props just by searching like cosplay this object. Um, so there's that resource. Um, and if, if you're talking glue, there's also the website this to that is really great to know about. And it'll be like, you can glue this to this versus, and I think they changed it recently so that it's a search bar maybe. So you've got like, I wanna glue plastic to glass and it'll output a thing that tells you what sort of glue you can use. Cause glues are actually more important than you think they are. <laughs> um, I like to use, uh, in addition to the Googles and the YouTubes, I like there's a website called Carbon Costume dot com and it literally is just a massive list of various characters from all sorts of media so there's anime there's traditional animation there's comic books comic book movies uh, film characters all that stuff and what they do is they break down one article or one outfit costume of that character uh, like in a list below it so it'll have something like simon phoenix from demolition man that was wesley snipes's weird feature character and so it had like this is where you get the overalls this is it's all by breaking it down to these components it, it made it much more uh, much easier to digest rather than trying to envision the whole cast but then they also include the props and so a lot of that is fun too uh doing killmonger his mask is right there from the black panther movie uh not his final form when he was the golden jaguar but still when he was just eric killmonger uh knocking over colonious museums and all that stuff it was great i didn't know they made fake hand grenades uh because a big part of his costume was the vest and he had these grenades and that kind of thing and i was literally considering things like well i can cut them out of cardboard and just have sort of like a 2d version of a grenade i can go to army surplus or military surplus stores and get dead grenades but that felt like probably not the best idea in a post 9 11 world to be carrying around you know actual grenades but on carbon costume they're like oh here's this weird toy inexplicably from uh, China or some weird shop where it looks like a grenade, but it also looks very obviously like a toy. So it's just this perfect happy medium that was found through Carbon Costume. They also have links to tutorials about making certain things. There's a ton of stuff on Pepakura. So the RPF is another website where they do all kinds of prop making, everything from working with things like Warbla, working with fiberglass, Pepakura is in there. Uh, all kinds of folds and carvings. It is a, it's a more of a form site. It's a little bit harder to navigate than sites are now. It's more of like, kind of like, this is what the websites were like back in 2005 to 2008. So it's a lot more the forum format as opposed to like the cool, more visual formats now. But if you dig around in there, it is very, very helpful. And oftentimes a lot of the people who post will also post links to like PDF and A4 files if you're doing Pepecura or they'll post links to uh, artists who have done commissions, a lot of people post things that they're working on. So we get a lot of that WIP content, which can also be really helpful. Watching other people try to make stuff can either inspire, answer, or just help you with what you're making. Uh, yeah, and, and that and also just being super, super annoying and engaged and asking a thousand questions at, at cons. I'm that weirdo who runs up to someone who has an amazing costume, like we all do. And then it's like, oh my God, that's so cool. How'd you do that? That's really great. How'd you do that? How'd you do that? Uh, most of the time, people are more than happy to say, like, oh, this is how I did this. And you're like, oh, that's brilliant. That's so great. Thank you. And um, but so, yeah, those are just a few of the resources that I've, I've used. Oh, and then Shapeways for 3D printing, because I don't have any skills with AutoCAD design. I also don't own a 3D printer. Um, but Shapeways.com is a great website that will connect you if you're someone like me who has an idea to someone who actually can design it, which is then connect them with someone who can actually print it. Uh, but again, going back to the three points, there's a little bit of time involved and there's definitely more money involved than trying to do it yourself. But it's still a helpful resource if you wanna go that route. Cool. Um, for those that are local to the Twin Cities, which is where our convention is hosted, I, I will also point you to a place that you can go when we're allowed to be in person more again. Uh, it's called the Hack Factory and you can you can visit there. They've got tools that you can borrow and share in workspace. Um, I haven't actually been there myself, but I've heard raving reviews and I've had other friends who do most of their big builds there at the Hack Factory. So they don't have to like purchase specialty tools themselves, which we all know can get very expensive. 
Um, and also there's other people there that you can bounce ideas off of and, and learn from. So if you're local to the Twin Cities and you're interested, you can look into the Hack Factory. There's also, um, we've got about, oh, there's go ahead, Cynthia. The, there's the tool library here in St. Paul and Minneapolis. And a lot of the libraries now here also have 3D printers that you can use. Cool. Lots of resources available. It's just sometimes hard to know where to look. So I very love, awesome. love the Twin Cities. All right, we have <laughs> probably about 10 minutes left. Um, so as we're as we're finishing up, if there's any other big thoughts that come, let's let's get them out there. But I am going to prompt us with one last question. Um, that is to show us your favorite prop that you've made and and tell us a little bit about what went into making it and why why it's your favorite. Who'd like to start? Um, yeah, I can go. So it's kind of, I don't know if this is against the rules like of the question, because it's still a work in progress. But um, I mentioned that character Cyclops, who I, I like. I think he's a very underrated character from the X-Men. Uh, Scott Summers, if you're unfamiliar with X-Men, he's a dude with the visor, uh, shoots red lasers. Uh, cool guy. But he has a very distinctive, at least in the 90s uh, depictions of him, he has a very distinctive sort of like one sash belt thing that comes comes with shoulders so it's not quite suspenders it's not really bracers or like a chest piece it's this weird off center thing uh which i can't sew uh really very well i have a machine i do a lot of hand stitching but fabric glue that is my jam that's where <laughs> i sit and live um and i can't really do a lot in terms of like the construction materials i can do some stuff here and there but I, again going back to some of the other points we were making earlier the idea of having to wear something that was like heavy metal or uh, any of those weird materials was not ideal. So 100%, uh, it is cardboard and masking tape to protect it. Uh, I can wear it, I can slip it on, actually. And I actually can't because I have my headphones on. But yes, so this is Scott Summers or Cyclops. Uh, there we go, I'll get it in focus that way. It looks, it's so pitch perfect. Uh, all I have to do is paint, oh, I shouldn't talk myself up. I'm really proud of it. Uh, it's very, very lightweight. It's very flexible. As you can kind of see, it's doing its sort of like wiggle giggle right now. Uh, also, as you can tell, like, again, for a bigger fellow like me, finding something that goes all the way around my waist off the rack, well, this would be a more expensive commission piece. I would have to go to somebody uh, uh, like an actual costumer or a seamstress or something like that to make something which is outside my budget. Uh, but I have tons and tons of cardboard. I have tons of masking tape. I also have stencils and that kind of thing. And in progress, like already, I feel like this is better than most of the props that I have done, uh, just because of it kind of combines those previous years of experience. Again, lightweight, breathable, flexible, fairly durable or durable enough for what I'll be using it for. Uh, and it's also a distinctive piece. So like once I throw it on with the blue bodysuit and the visor, I don't think there'll be many people who are like, who is that guy? Like if you're familiar with the X-Men, I think wearing this when it's completed, it'll be very, it'll be really apparent like, oh, it's that guy, that guy's doing the X-Men dude. He's doing that Cyclops bro or, or whatever. But I love this piece so much. I like to hug it, which is also great because it's all squishy and bouncy and flexibility, flexi. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's my favorite prop right now they're kind of like your kids or like pets like the favorites you, you don't really have any favorites but you totally have favorites it's just the favorites change over time uh, yeah so that's my baby ah. definitely favorites change over time. And, but unlike children sometimes i sell them <laughs> so i decided that for that i was going to go with marceline's guitar um, this was the first time that I actually made like a larger scale prop. Um, so it's special for that. Um, I had some experience. I've made lots of smaller props and I do that constantly for my business. Um, but making larger ones is like you have to think about where you're going to store it afterwards sometimes or if you even want to still keep it around. Like I have some 
I have some giant wings that are mounted on walls and I have some like a large headpiece that I made um, for like a goddess of death outfit. And that's pretty cool to keep on display, but like sometimes you get done with the things and you're like, I don't really want to keep this around, but I put so much time into it. Now what do I do with it? Um, so yeah, a large scale thing that I learned quite a bit working with it. Um, like I used a strap from a, um, a camera bag because I'd learned from my friend who does Wolfwood that I didn't want to deal with trying to just haul it around without any sort of strap on it. And I can just throw it over my shoulder and walk through crowds easily with it because it's not much wider than my shoulders. And like, I took other people's learning when I started this a lot, um, found people online who had went through each of the details that tends to make, show her guitar the best um, and knew what kinds of paint to use from other previous projects. But again, didn't know about the glue issue until later, which is unfortunate. But I still really appreciate having this around because it reminds me that I could actually go from making just tiny things into something larger and succeed in it. So yeah, Marceline's guitar, one of my favorite ones. Awesome. Uh, for my favorite one, I'm going to show you my TARDIS hat, but in order to do that, I have to get rid of my background. So now you get to see a little bit of my sewing studio mess. Um, my TARDIS hat is my favorite prop because it took so many different people's skills in order to make it happen. So it's made all with basically found items. Um, we had random packaging and craft foam and furniture foam sitting around, and that's the majority of the hat. And to to make it look TARDIS shaped, we had to you know cut them into proper dimensions to get the uh, ratio look to happen. Um, from another person, I learned that if you get that paper that they wrap meat in at the meat counter at the grocery store, you can print, you can attach that to the back of fabric, and then you can run that fabric through an inkjet printer using that, that certain type of paper and then you print right onto your fabric what you want and then there's a, another medium that you you kind of paint over the top of it and it seals the inkjet to the fabric so that you know if you happen to walk out and it starts sprinkling or it's too humid your ink won't run all over the place um, <clears throat> for this particular hat we also went and visited a, a costumer that specializes in bows and while we were there talking he literally whipped up these bows and there's also a couple bows on the back of the dress so you, we were going very victorian style in this and so he he really helped with that i did not make these bows he made them while we were there and all i had to do is tack them on pretty fantastic and then we have this lantern on the top <clears throat> um, there was a day that I was talking with some friends uh, my roommate had some friends over they're all involved in the SCA and they also like to do thrift shopping and so we were in the middle of sewing this project still working on the dress still trying to figure out how I'm going to make this hat and in my head I'm like I, I see some sort of little lantern on the top of it. And if I could find the right lantern, then I could paint it blue. Um, and a, a couple weeks later, I got home from work and there were three little lanterns sitting on the kitchen table for me to choose from because those friends had found them in the thrift stores. And this is the one I chose. Um, and 
put some some paper in behind the glass to cause it to be a little more opaque. And then I worked with another friend, I'll put that back in later, who does electronics, um, more engineering minded. We've got magnets to stick this on the hat, which is really great because then we put our own light inside put our own light inside, put it attached to speaker. I've got a cord that can run down and connect to a phone. I have no idea exactly how he made this, even though I watched and I helped. <laughs> but, you know, there's, you, if you're, you have to have, depending on the battery you're using and the cord you're using, you have to have certain levels of resistors so that the power from the battery doesn't blow out the speaker. It's complicated. There's websites that can help you figure it out yourself if you're if you're into that mindset, if you like that type of thing. Um, I used my friend. <laughs> and so when I've hooked this to my phone, I can play sounds and then the light will shine based on the sound that's coming through my phone. Uh, so this is my favorite prop. It's my most elaborate prop as well. It, um, it's not exactly heavy, except that because this is only held on by magnets, I do have to, you know, keep my head really steady when I'm wearing it. And then I did end up making a smaller version of it, and I can take the same lantern and put it on this hat instead and do the same thing with it. But in this hat, you can actually see my face where the other one has a veil that comes down completely and hides my face. So very, very uh, combination of all the things that we, we said here. Uh, time, took a lot of time, took a lot of skill. Um, not just my skill, but a whole bunch of different people's skills and co combining it together to make a really cool thing. So that's it's my good favorite. Friends and community. Yes, in fact, that is my favorite resource is is friends and communities and being able to talk talk through things. So each of you, what is the last thing you want to say to people about prop making? It's more fun with friends. Um, find materials and learn them. Um, like you can do amazing things with cardboard. If you don't want to work with cardboard, find something that makes your heart sing. I love leather. <laughs> um, because I can make so many different things with it. Um, so find a material and explore it. That's really good. Um, I think I would say that there's no wrong way, even when you make mistakes, even if you get to a point, um, like some of the examples from earlier in this uh, panel, where you realize the prop's not going to work or it comes out a way that you didn't expect. Uh, that's still a learning experience. So it's still oh, in the win column, it's still a net positive. Uh, so do it because you like it, do it because you love it. Don't worry about getting it wrong or getting it right, whatever that means. Just do it because you dig it. Um, but safety, safety. Oh yes, and safely, yeah. Feelings <laughs> are yes. a wrong way to do it. Feelings are the wrong way to do it. <laughs> Yes, if you find yourself talking to actual characters from the fictional property, uh, that's usually a bad sign. Or if, you know, seeing straight, staying conscious become challenging wearing your prop, usually that's like, oh, okay, that's not in the win column. That's more of a learning experience, but then make sure you are able to do it safely. Yes. <laughs> and my piece of advice will be always try. The best thing in life is to try try and learn and if you end up being unhappy with something well then you can try again all right thank you for joining our prop shop panel hopefully we at least inspired you to try some new things yourself create some props and also helped with a little bit of resources for things you can do not do and lessons learned um, if you want to talk more about props, we can always be found online or at the con. Um, 
today this year our our con is virtual and we've got some channels in our discord server that are specifically about costuming there's a costuming chat where you can go in there and you can ask questions and other people anyone from the con can reply and give you some advice so check out our discord and happy happy cosplay Bye.